Hey, Gregor, good morning for me. Good evening to you and welcome back. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm um, I think it's uh, it's been almost exactly a year, I think, right? It was the last fall that you're on. I think it was even end of October or something. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. So really, really close to a year ago. I know when you uh, first came out with um, the measure killer and everything and we're um, showing that around. And since then, I know certainly a, a few things have definitely changed in the back end of that. But uh, glad to have you back on and certainly glad to have a reason um, to bring you back on for some of the the expanded enterprise features that this tool certainly offered. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's it's been certainly an exciting year within the, <laughs> the, the BI space, not only on a lot of external tools that have been uh, growing uh, just within the the marketplace, but even internally within Microsoft. Right. There's a lot of change coming and already happening for sure. Exactly. Uh, like with most of my streams, what I love to do is uh, start with a little bit of an introduction. I think there's probably some people who will be watching this who are familiar with you, others who um, might uh, not know who you are or also what the, the external tools that you've uh, built um, that's uh, useful for Power BI. So if you want to start from there, I can give yourself a little um, context and uh, introduce yourself to the channel. Sure. Uh, so my name is Gregor Brunner. Um, I'm originally from Austria, but live in Switzerland and uh, basically have a small team of Power BI aficionados or nerds or however you want to call it. And so we're mostly doing development. Um, I've been working with Power BI for a long time. Basically, the first year it came out, I, I started with it. Um, Power BI and, designer um, back then. No, actually, when the, well, yeah, end of, I think it was end of 2015 or something. Mm -hmm. So, um, but back then, as we all know, it was pretty bad. And uh, <laughs> most people didn't really know what to do with it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't use it like now, like 24-7, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, so um, we're basically mostly doing development work, a little bit of consulting and trainings, but uh, development is, is our main uh, business. And then um, like around one and a half years ago, we started building this external tool called Measure Killer. It has a kind of crazy name, but it's catchy. Um, <laughs> and um, it was coincidence pretty much how we fell into developing this. Um, my team... Uh, and uh and i and um and basically it was a client who had some problems there was too many measures in a data set and nobody knew anymore what's going on and uh, the tools at the time didn't really work for our use case so um yeah we started building something on our own and it was pretty good and and then last year um uh, klaus and i klaus is my senior developer he's our main developer on the tool python expert um, and um, because measure killer is mostly coded in Python. Um, and then basically, um, yeah, uh, we started to build something. And, uh, and then last year, I think it was just released um, and we had an early version and we showed that on the stream. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, now I'm back and I just want to show what has happened in the last year or so, because I think a lot has happened. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I know previously um, the the build would work essentially on a local PBIX file. I'd, would it would it connect to a single one in the service at all yet, or was it just a just a no. local file? Yeah, it was a local single file only. File. Yeah, and it it would essentially just you know report data set. It would tell you unused measures and unused columns, I believe. Um, but that yes. was the, the the only scope of it. But I know the immediate request from everyone um, on calls uh and even in, in the chat was just like would this work against shared data sets and i know that's something that in the last year has been added and i'm sure a few others but that's what was immediately one of the biggest ones that was requested for it and i i use it honestly with every single uh report that's given to me because i'm i'm an auditor in, in a lot of ways like I, i'm the person who needs to come in and trim the fat on a model like Basically, 100% of my clients will come to me usually with they need architectural guidance and they they need to make this file better, you know, clean up the data set and the mm. it's painful to review it otherwise. Um, I know we used to use M MK's uh, Feldman, uh, right. one of the best Power yeah. Query experts out there, and she yes, had sir. previously built a was it the is the Power BI cleaner I think that Correct. she called yeah. it, which similarly would identify measures and columns. Um, but she, I think even like a year ago, she retired it and there's even a little link on the top of her blog post that's updated saying, I'm just not supporting this anymore. 
there's a better tool for this, which is just uh, to use the measure killer, um, which click a button and it immediately generates all that. I also do want to like, uh, I see what you have onto the screen. So as we're talking about it, I'm happy to show some of this over here. There we go. But um, yeah, like it, it's being able to just clean this up. And honestly, even on your own data sets, this doesn't even have to apply to a consultant. Like I have built plenty of reports where after a while, enough requirements change where you delete a page. A page has been changed, edited. And at some point you probably removed a set of visuals that basically now has disabled a measure. It's no longer used in your model. So how do you even identify that? But um, I don't, it's essentially impossible to actually remove anything from a, a master shared data set if you don't use something like this, just because there's that house of cards. If you touch this, how do you know which, which reports are going to break? So once you've added something to a core data set, it's kind of previously been locked in stone because there's just no easy way to identify, is that going to break any downstream reports or self-service reports or anything else? Um, so it's. I think this is very helpful to be able to trim the fat off of shared data sets for sure. But that's, the, you know, I'll step back from, from my position on kind of how I've used it, but I'd love to hear kind of some, uh, not only kind of what this does uh, you know, uh, natively, but also what are the, some of the things that have happened in the last 12 months that has been an expansion of its features. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, shared data sets was something that was almost impossible before. To do it manually, you would have to spend so much time. Nobody ever wanted to do that. Even a bunch of interns would go crazy probably uh, doing this for weeks. Um, and that's why we, we our first real mission was to try and figure out the shared data set. Multiple reports connected to one data set and then get the analysis and then prevent anything from breaking mm -hmm. down but cutting off the fat, like you said. And I think we achieved that earlier this year, like in January, February or something. Um, and then we realized, okay, we have something that is really good and um, is working. And let's let's see, uh, we, we just built out the features. So last year um, on the stream, we only had this single report, single file, single report slash data set, right? And then we built this, um, the shared uh, or golden data set, but locally. So that's that was the second mode. You have to find all the report files yourself you, you got to download the data set as well, and you put everything into this local analysis here in the second mode of, of Measure Killer. And those two modes are also free to use, completely uh, have all the features basically, um, and will also stay free. And then now, um, since also companies uh, got interested and uh, we're also doing a lot of demos and some organizations obviously they cannot uh, download the data sets uh, nobody knows where any connected reports might be we built out these cloud features that run in the power bi service and those are like paid upgrades so those two are basically paid upgrades and this is something new that we're currently working on um yeah so it has been quite um quite uh, uh, interesting path that uh, we've taken in last year. Um, but I think, um, like you said earlier, um, it's this shared data sets, especially the ones that live in the Power BI service, they're mm -hmm. kind of untouchable. And the problem is every day they get bigger, right? <laughs> they never get smaller. And our mission was really to provide some kind of solution to that problem because nobody really cared about this and i guess at some point your capacity gets bigger you have to upgrade from p1 to p2 p2 to p3 and uh, it's not really how it should be because a lot of times what we see in, in especially those bigger ones is maybe 30 percent maybe 40 percent of the model is not used anywhere but nobody at least that. yeah yeah could be more i mean that's that, that's essentially so, what i before this existed, like for the most part, I would just, you know, if a client's like, so well, I want to clean up my data set. Oh, it's fine. It's, if it's a one-to-one, -one, super easy. Like, you know, a few hours spent on it, but I can clean it up. But if it's shared at all, like, so the amount of hours that I will have to bill for, you need to give me every single file. I'm going to have to go through basically visual by visual, page by page, filter by filter, and, and collectively write down what's used and not used and figure out how to do that. Like it, it would have been dozens of hours and like you know at this point shared data sets once it's added it's never going to come out you can only add more but 
there you, you can't really take back um so that it was it's, you know it was not impossible but it was so time consuming that it was honestly not worth the price most of the time um or you'd have to find the the intern or the junior analyst to, to pass down the, the the grunt work of documentation for them to go through and again like find out what is and isn't used per report um so it's i'm actually curious in the shared and you might get into this but the shared golden data set like i've I know project files exist. I've um, I've not deployed them to clients yet. I've I use them. I know we have the re, uh, PBIR, the report, and the data set file separately mm -hmm. in the project file. So, um, at least with PBIXs, I've used this the, the local machine one, where you yep. select your data set, you select your reports as a PBIX. Does it work mm -hmm. with the project uh, extension files where you can select the data set file and the report um, files to be able to scan between? Yeah, so we also have PBIP, um, and then it basically takes those folders. I think the PBIP is not in this, in the first two modes, in the offline modes. I think it's not in there yet. I'm not completely sure. Um, but um, it's basically the same thing for us. For us, it's not. there is no real difference uh, inside. It still looks the same. It's just separated in, in two folders, basically. Um, okay, so it, it, yes. it works with the new file extensions, essentially. You're, you're still scanning yes, data yes. set. Okay, perfect. Because um, yeah. otherwise, the package is nearly identical. It's it's just that, uh, you know, exactly. it's a better folder structure, which, if anything, would hopefully make something like this a little easier, too. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I think also Microsoft is, is trying to, to make this easier and better. And yeah. uh, probably it will only make our life easier in the future and um, will improve the whole um, architecture in a way. So I have a great question yeah, so maybe, from Matthias. Uh, oh. yeah, again, well, yeah, we could actually walk through a thing, but is, is this relevant for pro org? So if you can pop back up that core menu, the, the initial pop-up menu that we yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially the like the two buttons that you have here for shared data sets is if you're only in pro, you can't do the XMLA because that's only available yes. for premium per user or premium capacity workspaces to connect online, but you can do it locally. So if you have one data set uh, file, um, and 15 report files. Let's just assume there's still PBXs, which is fine. You can essentially use that to point to your data set, point to all the reports that are connected to it, and it will scan for those appropriate measures and um, and all that. So it, it does work for pro orgs. They have kind of options between pro and premium. You either have to do it locally or in the cloud. I'm guessing at some point we'll see some of those, but I just wanted to make sure we could answer that question early on. Definitely. And also the, the thing, the good thing for you is then uh, it's also, you can use measure killers for free, right? So if you have everything offline, uh, it's part of the free version. Mm -hmm. exactly. So that's also where we kind of draw the line. You know, if people have premium, um, bigger organizations, they want some support. That's when we also said, okay, let's, let's create a paid version that has support and that, um, maybe, yeah, goes into the service and, and is more sophisticated there in searching through the tenant in a way. Yeah. Now, um, I know there's some of the newer stuff is related to the tenant mode. I'm also curious about what the analysis will do, but uh, do you want to do like a quick run through of a uh, yes. scan of maybe like one and then do like a, a quick exactly. shared data set one? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to analyze this local report I have here. You can see a bunch of measures and tables, nothing super fancy. But I just, um, yeah, I can either run it from inside Power BI or I can just select the local host and the file here. And you can see now um, it finished pretty quickly. Um, I can see immediately how much of the data model is used anywhere. So the whole promise is um, that you, whatever is unused, you can remove that without anything breaking down. So it can be used in relationships, in measures, but obviously also in filters and visuals, conditional formatting, column sorting, incremental refresh. Like we try to cover everything. There are some limitations. I don't want to say this is the perfect tool that can do everything. There are some limitations that are listed here, very, um, very specific things. So the measurekiller.com website. Um, and uh, this is what we're aware of that does not work. Like some sensitivity labels um, has problems in the past because they kind of lock the file and we, we cannot take a look then. Um, but generally, um, basically goes through everything. And then what you get here is this main output and you can see the red rows are the ones that are uh, unused. So those are 
potential has the potential to be deleted. And then the other ones have this little expand. So I can see, oh, this customer key that is part of my fact table, it's used in an active relationship with the dim customers table. It's used in an M expression. It's also important. And that's why the other ones don't expand is because this is just yes. a list of how it is used, whether or not it is a relationship, exactly a filter, uh, any any touch point that it would have. Yeah, exactly. I will just notice because uh, um, I I, um, I didn't realize you you have uh, dark mode um, available in this oh, now. So I I actually yeah. I, I I've noticed this a couple times, and I'll just quickly mention as feedback is I open Measure Killer. It says to update. Um, it goes to your website, and you can either you know install locally or through the Microsoft Store. Which in general I recommend for most people if you have a store version to install that auto updates, but if I click on that, it says I have the latest version already. So it's the, uh, I don't think the store has the same latest build as maybe the direct download does. It should have, uh, it should have 1.2.1. 1. Um, yeah, because whenever I click on that, it, 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 it there's no update button. It just says installed for me. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think there are some problems with the automatic, automatic updates um, of the store version, because here you can see I even put in this the, the, the photo. Oh yeah, one, so it does have the new one. picture. But but yeah, exactly. So so but it, there is a problem with the auto update. That's actually one thing I realized, but I never figured out how to fix because it should do that automatically. But yeah, there's. I will say I've I've experienced updates. very similar pains, not with the Microsoft Store, but back when I <laughs> was still producing my Google Analytics report in the the App Store store, like the approval process and and. Uh, it's just very complicated for small business owners yeah. to put stuff into Microsoft stores and also make sure it's updated. And if it breaks to make sure you can take it off, but digressions aside. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I love, you know, with most products, like I love the fact that there is a dark mode available for it. If I can avoid staring at a bright white screen. It saves my eyes so much at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. And so we have this output Then um, obviously what do we, what else do we see here? Uh, we can just collapse this again. We can see, so generally every row here is either a column or a measure or a calculated column. That's for us mm -hmm. artifacts. They belong to the data set and that's what we're mostly interested in. If I go to filter unused, I can see everything that is not used. I can also see the size. The thing that I always do as soon as I do the analysis, actually I sort by size. Maybe we should do that um, by default, but default I think is just alphabetically. Um, but I wanna see the, the biggest ones, are they used? And look here, you can see this is only, oh, it's actually an M expression. But sometimes some fields and the very costly ones are only used, for example, in a relationship. And then if mm -hmm. nothing in that table is used, you can even kick that out, even though it is used somewhere, right? So even the things that are used maybe once or twice, maybe there's a way to get rid of them because you don't really need them. Um, but everything in red, we can kick out for sure. Um, and then we have these automatic features to kill measures. I'm just gonna demo this real quick. So we have three uh, unused measures. Uh, you can see them also here, those year to date measures. Um, and when I go to kill, let's kill profit measure. Okay, let's do yes. Then basically it's running a script in the background and it also can run measure kill again. And then it's already gone. It's like executing yep. a C sharp script from tablet editor. Um, and it can only do it for the measures, the columns, it gives you the script, but you do have to go and um, edit that or put, put the script in yourself. Right. Yeah. So for that, we get all the tables that have unused columns mm -hmm. and then it generates this M code and I can copy paste this into Power Query. And then it's a very safe way to remove those. It actually can remove calculated columns automatically now. So that's something also we added. Oh, it can. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Cause I, I know previously it was just, you know, it is a easy transition over that. So an another curiosity, one thing that I, I noticed that it, um, there are certain tables that if you do look for unused columns, then if the table is not used, it, it actually removes all the columns. There's no columns left in the query. It actually empties yes. it out. So, and I, I didn't realize that until I pasted the M code in it. Oh, yeah. so this table actually can just be deleted because it, it unselected every exactly. single column. So curiously, exactly. is there, a, is there a, a flag where it kind of identifies that it's just table removal? So you can see it from this interface that the table itself is empty or? Right now, the whole thing is built on columns and things like this. And it's it's quite rare that you don't use a whole table, but in that case, yeah, you will realize it. And then basically it's a table without any columns. 
Um, yeah, because I I, I think just like it, it's either way you'll remove it, but it, a, an extra small little visual indicator just to, like or an extra label to say you know, uh, table table is empty or something like that to to mention to people from this interface. You, you don't have to copy M code. You can just delete the table. Right click and delete. Yeah, we, currently we just don't have any view for tables really, but um, yeah, it's, it's it's worth thinking about it because um, yeah, right click delete is, is, is the easiest obviously. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so then uh, something else that we can do is to just extract all of this. We can just uh, put this into an Excel file and get a nice uh, little documentation. This will have more than uh, what we see in the measure killer um, main uh, output. Um, so if I just, uh, let me just make this. Have you been getting a lot of those new office pop-ups recently, especially the, like your privacy matters to us, which, you know, please click. Okay. And I've had that like 15 times in word. I don't know what they recently did with, with their new policies, but I'm getting a ton of like, you know, we respect your privacy pop-ups, uh, in, in like PowerPoint word and Excel. It's annoying. Um, yeah, so here we have the Excel documentation and actually at first, we didn't think this was going to be very useful, but people really like it. Um, you can see everything in much more detail. You can see, I don't know, on which page things are used, the visual titles, subtitles, the type of visual, uh, visual IDs. And maybe Does it have the code? There you the go. Okay, page. good. There we go. Yeah. See, th this is a good, I, I would honestly recommend this as a practice. Like if you are going to delete something for archival purposes, I mean, one, you the file should be version controlled, hopefully, but separately, it just quickly exporting this and just saving this. So, you know, it's someday in the future, right. if somebody wants to know what was removed, you have a, a printed right. list of all the items that were gutted. Exactly. Actually, even though um, we have this restore feature here, so um, you can see here, um, this is me restoring the year to date, uh, removing the year to date profit fee, uh, measure. So we can um, restore and anything that we kill, like calculated columns and measures, uh -huh. we can restore them at any point. Um, okay. So, so you does can this uh, have a whole do, list. Do you have to back it up yourself or does this automatically create a snapshot every, every time? time like it's, okay. Every time you kill something, it, it creates a backup. And now I can go to restore. Oh, actually, I have to select something. Sorry. I don't know the UI enough. Um, and let's just see, because I want to show you exactly what happens in Power BI. It just comes back to life. You can see here, cost and revenue only. And then I'm going to go up restore selected. I've never used the restore, but that's actually really nice. Boom. I didn't realize that there is the auto backup. That's cool. And it keeps the formatting. Yeah. Oh, and that's comment. okay. Yeah. So it's just like before. The only thing I think it doesn't do is this formatting here. I think here still might be a problem what I remember but that's if you really I mean first of all always keep backups guys uh, backups uh, guys because that's just really yeah it's it's not perfect yet there is probably something we missed and uh, if you're the lucky one who who has a problem then uh, yeah something could break right so always keep backups of your power bi file um but uh, even if you did something only if you save the file, right? Then it will really overwrite the old version. So um, keep that in mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's it from just the main things. Um, and maybe now we can go into um, the more interesting part. Um, so we have those two modes that run in the Power BI service. This is just if you want to have one data set and multiple files and analyze them, but you download everything yourself. But this is the third mode will run in the Power BI service. So here we have this new window opening and you, you need to authenticate with the Microsoft account. But since I tested it before, it saved uh, my authentication token. And then as you pointed out, this is uh, we're doing an XMLA connection on the data set, which is a premium feature. So here I only see premium workspaces in my tenant and only the ones I have access to with my user. This because this goes through my uh, user account um, and, and I'm gonna select this MK workspace because it's all about selecting a data set. So we wanna, um, maybe I can show this also in the UI. We wanna um, analyze and optimize one data set. 
Um, mm -hmm. And that's basically, uh, I select, uh, I take this from the MK workspace. I can see that it's connected to a couple of reports. And if I go to this impact analysis, I can see we have 12 Power BI reports and five paginated reports connected to that data set right now. And then down here, I see, oh, there's more, but I don't have access to that. And that's why we built this tenant admin mode that I'll show afterwards, um, that is searching through the whole tenant, not only to what I have access to personally, but everything. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, the, whatever we have access to will be enough. Um, mm, agreed. So, so I, uh, so I select the, the data set here, uh, and now it's doing this XML connection. Um, and, and then I might have to, uh, okay, I have to, uh, log in again. I have to fully authenticate. This is, yeah, I'm usually not working on this VM, so <laughs> no worries. I'm saving any of my credentials. Um, and now I get a list of all the workspaces, right? We could also build reports on top of a premium data set in a non-premium workspace. I don't even know why this is possible, but I guess it is. Um, and then this is basically now the list of workspaces that I want to search for. Like I want to search for reports in these workspaces that might have been built on top of this data set. So and I'm just going to, I don't know, I can just search everything. Might take a little while depending on internet connection, everything. But it's just doing some API calls now to figure out the lineage of this data set. Uh, mm -hmm. basically exactly what we see here. Um, and then, uh, it will give me a list of reports that, uh, it found. And that's basically a power BI reports and, uh, page needed reports. And it will. And just to reiterate, exactly. um, as well that the, mm -hmm. to get this to accurately map everything you need to be, you need to have build permissions in every workspace that has a report that this shared data set uses, uses, right? Um, so in the workspace, we only need contributor on the, for, we're only interested in the reports, right? So you have to have access to the data set. You have to have viewer and build. I'm not sure. Do you need build? Probably. I think, yeah, for XMLA, I think you need build. So you need to have viewer and build in the data set workspace. Because view, viewers then, won't have build, but it's, uh, Contributor, yeah. member, admin. So any of those three levels in every workspace that the all the reports are in, I think, right? Um, well, we need uh, we need viewer and build in the data set workspace, and then in the reports only contributor. I think contributor I don't think is viewers can't viewers can't have build though. I didn't think I, like viewers are just read only, but member, contributor, admin has. Yes, but for the reports, that's enough. Okay, for the reports, it's enough. Uh, gotcha. Because we're only interested in the report layout in those workspaces. True. Okay. Um, Fair enough. And and then basically, actually, I made a little mistake before because um, I have I have access to all those workspaces, and I have to remove myself because <laughs> um, I ran it before. And um, uh, let me one second. I think uh, this is good because otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, this. Uh, one second. Just have to at least from one workspace take away my permissions, because when I was testing it before, um, it gave me already access to the workspace and it didn't remove it because I stopped the execution. Uh, one second, please. So those here, that's the. Those are the interesting ones. And also curious if it if it detects that there's a a report somewhere that's using this data set that you don't have permissions to read in, in that particular workspace, mm -hmm. uh, will it throw it will it give you any indication or error? Like you need you, you need elevated permissions in workspace A to you know to access the the, the report layout. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you if you don't have a contributor, if you only have viewer, it will say error, authentication failed, or cannot get a report or something. Um, that's that's taken care of. So Excellent. since I so I just removed um, my access from those two workspaces, so I'm just gonna reset because taking away the access um, it always 
takes a few seconds. Uh, I'm just going to double check if it's gone now so that um, we can show also the difference between. Oh, yeah, it's gone. Okay, so let me just do this again um, because now um, we will see less than what we will see after when we run it as an admin. That's the whole point. Um, you can see also now it's saved all the credentials, right? I don't have to authenticate again. Um, but I'm going to just run through all of the workspaces. And this can take some time. So um, through the normal API calls, um, this takes a few seconds. Um, and then later when we run as an admin, it's it's much, much faster. Mm, um, because okay. it, it can leverage different API calls for that. Okay. So, um, yeah. So now those... Okay, so those are fine, um, but there's two more workspaces basically that are are there, and um, I just uh, I don't have access right now. Even mm -hmm. though I'm a tenant admin, and that's something I think that a lot of people, or I also didn't know until I did one of the presentations, and we kind of figured that out. That even if you're a tenant admin, you don't uh, you don't see everything in this uh, in this lineage view here, um, in this impact analysis, right? Um, it, it's it only gives you like a hint of um of it of there being more reports somewhere that you don't have access to but um even as a tenant admin you don't automatically see everything so um that's just i think yeah a limitation and how how they built it um but it's just good to remember that as an admin if you want to make sure you don't miss anything you have to go into the admin portal and give you access manually or programmatically to all workspaces in a way, or do good API calls in the end. Yeah. Um, so this is the online analysis here, and we can see all the reports it found, mm -hmm. Power BI and PageNet reports, everything is automatic here. Um, and then now here, we, we added this option to drag and drop local files. Um, why? Because sometimes we have something in dev or, um, we might have a, an analyze an Excel file somewhere and the finance people will never upload that to the Power BI service and will not be able to read it from there probably. So we added this drag and drop functionality to add stuff that maybe this analysis would, would be missing. Okay, I was just like, the, that's literally the question that just came up is he uh, from Donald is does, does it detect usage by Excel oh. client pivot tables? It's essentially the local files that are not in the service but somebody might have built right. a self-service report from. So that's actually really nice that you can combine a service scan with local files, including any ones that are using the Analyze and Excel option, essentially. Right. And you, of, of course, you have to find the people doing that. We, we are <laughs> not going to tell you where this is happening. Who knows what's going on? Yep. But uh, probably you have an idea. Um, and... Uh, yeah, because for us, the whole point is to not miss anything. Otherwise, they, we will delete something that somebody might be using, right? Um, and here, obviously, we can also take out some things. Um, I need to use my screen keyboard for that because the Mac uh, keyboard doesn't have the delete. Oh, sorry, it doesn't have the delete button, so I need to do it like this. <laughs> um, and that's that's how we can take it out. So I can put it back in with Enter, but I need to take it out with delete. Actually, we, we need to fix this in a future release because if you have a Mac and you're using a VM, it's, it's annoying. Yep, Yeah. agreed. So, okay, so you have everything here. Um, let's say you're done, you click on run. And then um, it's just fetching um, the metadata. That's also something really, really important. Measure Killer only analyzes the metadata of the data sets, but also the reports. So we're only interested in the name of the column, the name of the measure, the DAX expression measure, but never in what the output is, how many rows you have. It doesn't actually matter for us. For us, it matters how many measures you have, how many columns you have, how many visuals, even custom visuals. That will increase or slow down the speed of, of the measure killer analysis, but not if you have one row or 100 million rows. Yep, that's fair. It's the, it's the number of objects that are basically in the report. Right. And custom visuals, for example, slow it down a lot because you have a lot a bigger, bigger file in the end. Mm, okay. um, yeah, so some some peculiarities. You can see now 
84%. This is a pretty good model, I would say. I mean, obviously it's tiny, but still 84% is used. Um, three, 15, 16% is unused. But um, yeah, we can we can take a look. Um, and, and now uh, what is different is you can see that some artifacts don't belong to the data set because um, they were built in the thin files. Those are report level measures. And I can see them here as well. I can also see how often they're used or something like this, but we just, we don't really care about them. They are also documented through the Excel, but uh, we don't really want to delete them or anything. We don't, it doesn't really matter so much to us. For us, it's all about the data set. I'm very much liking the, the hybrid combination of cloud and, and local. Again, like there's, yes, there's a degree of lineage of tracking down those things. Maybe sending a company email, hey, is there anyone who has built a data, you know, done any build permissions against a data set? But I think if you can collect all of those and do a scan, it, it really will go a long way to helping clean up that six-year-old model that has slow, slowly grown and gotten fatter and kind of turned into a Frankenstein monster without having exactly. to reinvent the wheel. And here in this online mode, we can also write to XMLA if people want that. We can mm -hmm. remove measures, uh, calculate the columns, and probably soon also the power query columns, which is by writing to the data set. Um, if people want that, obviously, it's, uh, we give a lot of warnings because it's very risky. You cannot download the data set anymore. But yeah, people should know that when they start doing these things. So, um, and then let's just quickly jump to the last mode because we want to see what the difference is, right? The tenant admin mode. I'm just going to select exactly the same things as before. Um, so I'm going to go to MK. I'm going to go to this weather data set. And then um, you can see now we have a lot more workspaces. So those are basically all the workspaces in our tenant. Um, and then I can just click on find all connected reports. And now it's doing those admin API calls because I am a tenant admin. And now you can see also it's finding this so test 66, those, mm -hmm. those reports here. Um, and, and then how does that work? Uh, I have the same functionality as before. I can drop in local files, but when I click on run, I'm going to say yes. Oh, um, measure killer will provide you with access to two workspaces. So it's giving me mm -hmm. temporarily access, only then it can do the analysis. So it's giving me contributor um, for the time of the analysis. And I'm gonna say, yes, continue. You can see here, we have like a limitation of uh, 200 per hour. So we can only give you access to 200 workspaces per hour, which should be enough, hopefully in most cases. Um, and then uh, basically it granted me this access and then we have a cool down of 30 seconds just because it takes a little bit sometimes um, and just we just want to make sure that we don't do the analysis too quickly um, and once this is done it automatically starts uh, getting those report layouts or the, the metadata the visual filters and everything of the reports we selected and then um, it runs um, the main analysis and once that is done um, it will say, do you also want to remove the access again from the workspaces I just gave you? Because maybe you want to keep it, but in most cases, probably we just don't want to have too much access. And, um, yeah, and then it just does the same thing, uh, just on top of two more reports. So we can be sure that those also will not break down if we, um, and maybe remove. I missed it earlier, but curiously on the, on the, the data sets that this, sorry, the, the workspaces that this scans, does this include other people's personal workspaces at all? Or is that something you no. need to like, you need to ask, uh, reach out to ask about? We don't, uh, include any personal workspaces. Uh, we don't even want to mess with those. Um, we assume that nothing important is going on there. Okay. Cause I, I, I know you can at least. The API is available to scan those because um, I've, I've seen tools yeah. like uh, Alex, the, the, the Power BI Sentinel from Alex Whittle does tell you what reports and data sets are in what people's workspaces. So you can like slap somebody on the wrist if they have 55 reports published in their personal workspace. I don't know about the right. metadata behind it, but. That would be um, 
interesting use case for our new mode, the tenant analysis, actually, because there we yeah. are scanning more things in the tenant. Maybe that's something we could add there, actually. Yeah, so, but yeah, because maybe not necessarily to... reaching in to, to delete it, but it, it, it could be useful just to know that, like, oh, there's Michelle has 15 published reports in her personal workspace all connected to this data set, which might be like, I should probably have a conversation with this person and why they have so many personal reports reports connected to this right right yeah um of course we, we i think we can do that um just in some organizations with thousands and thousands of users um then suddenly you have a lot of workspaces mm -hmm. um that's why also we wanted to not include the personal ones um okay, but hey uh, maybe maybe for the tenant analysis it's a it's a good idea yeah, yeah no, so I, you can I, see absolutely. now at the end at yeah. the end here, it removed uh, the access from, from the workspaces it gave me earlier. And now mm, we have okay. the same, well, not exactly the same output, but similar. And we can make sure that those reports also will stand after we do our cleanup of the shared data set. Yeah. Something yeah, else think, that... Go uh, ahead. Mm -hmm. Something else that we added um, a couple months ago is uh, measure killer analytics. Um, mm, that is okay. something completely new. Um, I wanted to include some stuff there that has never, that I have never seen anywhere. For example, um, here you can see um, we have a different view now. Oh, sorry, we have a different view now. We have basically the data set and then all the reports. And we can see um, how much of the data set is being consumed by a single report. So we can see which reports are more costly to us and which reports come cheap. Um, and it just means how many columns or which columns they're basically um, using in those reports. And we can go down into the reports and then, for example, see um, page tooltip page. We can see exactly what is used there. A filter on the whole page and then I can go in here and I can see um, which which columns are referenced there. And basically we're summing up all those columns and that gives the size of the uh, rep the size that the, the report is using. That's very useful. Because here, that's actually where, for example, if you wanna remove a page, you will be able to see here um, how much this page is consuming. And um, we have this, those two columns, and then here this distinct, that means it's only used there. So for example, okay. unfortunately we have nothing in the reports now, but in the data set, uh, we can see that, for example, this wind direction column, it's 5% it's of my model, and it's only used in a relationship. Yeah? Um, obviously, and the percentage it's, it's, is based purely on, on megabytes. It's not cardinality or anything. It's just, it's actual physical size, right? It's gotcha. the uncompressed size of the data set, exactly. Okay, gotcha. So here I can really get a more in-depth view of what's going on, and maybe I can really see some interesting stuff, um, especially when I look at this distinct, and I can see maybe some reports are more heavy than other ones in terms of uh, artifacts that uh, they're using. And I think this is really useful because I, I've never seen this anywhere. And I thought, hey, we have all the information. Let's let's build this out, right? Um, yeah. So, and, and there's one more thing in this analytics. It's the calculations. Um, so here we try to approximate um, a size, meaning also how much of the data model is used for measures and calculated columns, mostly measures actually because measures don't have a size as we know, but um, we can say that, well, if a measure is using this and this and this column, and those columns mm. use this, this much of the data set, this measure actually is using this. And then also here we can say, oh, condition I can see, this is blue. It says 5% distinct means this column is only used in this measure. If I delete this measure, I know I'll be able to save 5% of my model just by deleting one measure. That's okay. I do really need yeah, this. Yeah, that's measure. awesome. You know, then you start thinking, right? Like, is it really important? Is there a workaround where 
anyway, but we just want to provide this view and we're actively looking for feedback from the community also for this. This is part of the free feed in all of the modes. You can have this. So it's, it's available to any, anyone. Um, and you can see also, for example, um, how often this measure is used. You can also see how many artifacts the measure is using. So basically how, how, how many columns are referenced in the DAX expression, for example. Yeah. Um, and here, I like this because it gives a different perspective than the uh, the Veritapak analyzer, which breaks down the columns, but it, it doesn't show the the interconnectedness of, of everything. Right, because here we can we can see that this calculated column is using two columns, but then there's a that calculated column also used by it, and then you can go down this whole hierarchy basically um, mm -hmm. and see what is using what until you end you end up with a final use as we as we call it. Um, so this is just some something that we played around with. Um, yeah, and we, we, we like to see uh, from people what they think about it. It's it's quite complex uh, in some cases, but generally I think it's it's uh, it's something new. And um, why not? Why not include that? No, I'm liking have... the the additional analysis that that comes both from the the model perspective, um, and I think. What well, is on our on our analytics? If you drop down that that preview again, so yeah, the do you, do you have anything else uh, that you have as a vision of stuff that you're wanting to analyze in the future? Oh yeah, uh, we have a lot of stuff. Uh, we're just always struggling around what to prioritize, what to do. <laughs> sure, uh, because also. Yeah, we're a small team. We're like uh, five people right now. Not everybody is working on measure, but a lot of our resources are going there because, first of all, it's super exciting, and also we are getting a lot of interest also from organizations and people. <laughs> and sure. The last few months it grew a lot. Actually, it was surprising, like thirty percent a month or something. We got more more users, and uh, yeah, I posted something on LinkedIn the other day. I think we already hit the one hundred has been used in one hundred countries already. <laughs> So it's really nice. Amazing. Okay, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Um, so the thing that we're currently working on is this tenant analysis. So there um, we want to find also we want to add stuff that nobody else has really thought of yet. For example, um, we're going to run an analysis for the tenant and we'll give you, for example, um, I don't know, which reports contain custom visuals, uh, which custom visuals those are, um, uh, how many pages a re your reports have, um, uh, how many report level measures are uh, in, a, in a thin file. Um, all those things that you don't really see these days, or it's, I don't know, any at least any tools that give you that. Um, and uh, yeah, we have this information. We thought, hey, it might be cool to to add it and, and see what happens. I think you just certainly getting a breakdown, especially including personal workspaces. Um, for a lot of the clients that are medium-sized business up to enterprise, I think it's going to be super helpful. Um, it can become very unruly to to try to manage that stuff and also be able to just get a breakdown of what are the biggest pressure and pain points that you need to address with, with at the at the thirty thousand foot tenant level, there's not a lot not a lot of <laughs> things let you observe it from the, uh, and get get a summary um, that easily. Right. Yeah. Um, look, uh, if if people have ideas, um, you can give us feedback. Um, we have this uh, we have this blog uh, on our website. Actually, it's also built into a measure killer. <laughs> uh, let me just open the main window. Yeah, here you can also give feedback and you also have the release notes you have some videos on our youtube but if you give feedback you end up um here and you can basically add um comments here uh, you can either report bugs or also just give us feedback on what you like uh, what you like to see um things like this and yeah there's a lot of things we can do because most uh, most other external tools only look at the model, right? They, they look at the data sets and the relationships and things like this. And in the Power BI service also, most they just do some API calls to, I don't know, build some lineage and things like this. But we can also look into the reports 
and that gives us just a whole new world basically and then mm. it's all about what what makes most sense and um yeah some people also they have problems like migrating uh, stuff or they're just overwhelmed by the sheer size of the tenant and they have no idea anymore what's going on that's why um we're trying to um really um yeah contribute to to that to those um to fixing those problems with with our new developments and what we try to achieve is basically to help you clean up your whole tenant so mm -hmm. um, maybe you want to start uh, by going into the premium fabric capacity metric sorry fabric i think it's called like that right no uh, yeah fab fabric capacity yeah um, if you go into your metrics, you can see which data sets are most costly, and then um, you can select those and basically run run them through Measure Killer. And what we will also do um, in the tenant analysis is that you can not only select one data set, but you can run it basically at scale for multiple data sets uh, at once, and then it will tell you where you can save the most because imagine you have a hundred shared data sets in your organization maybe it's too much most won't have that but um those are probably the people that we're mostly interested in working with because they have the most to gain from from all of this right um yep and and then it's all about okay how much compute does um do certain data sets consume but also on the other hand, maybe the most costly data set in terms of, uh, what's it called? Uh, compute units or something like this. The most costly one, the biggest one there, maybe 99% of it is used, but maybe the second one, 70% is unused. Nobody knows that, right? That's why yep. we also need to run it at scale. And then we're also trying to query those capacity metrics. We would like to have pull everything together in our tool that we can say, this is the data set that you should start with because here you can gain two gigabytes or three gigabytes of uncompressed yeah, size. Exactly. And the I think you've done a good job of also just breaking down the free versus pay list. The small to medium businesses that have 15 reports and three data sets, it's, they probably have access to the one folder where all that's kept or it's pretty easy to get those files and you can run it locally for free. But then as soon as you actually have a company that's big enough that that's paying for any type of premium, they're typically the ones who can also afford a, you know, a bit extra a month to, to pay for something like this to be able to then actually scan the, the tenant. So I, I think you've done a good job of transitioning from free to paid at the level that companies can, once they're paying for premium, they're going to want also all, want additional resources to, to pair with that. So it's, you know, it, it'll be the measure killer tool. It's going to be the you know, Power BI Sentinel, which I recommend to pretty much all yeah. of my clients for, for a good monitoring tool. Um, they're starting to use the custom visuals, but they're the ones who it's, you know, don't mind too much, pay a little bit extra when like, oh wait, I can see how many hours a month <laughs> from my employees. Um, yeah, clearly a huge ROI. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're paying for, for saving time for your team <laughs> with, with this stuff. So. That's how I always like, don't think of this as a, as a sunk cost. Think of it as you're getting hours of the day back for your employees. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, there are so many manual tasks when working with Power BI, yeah. unfortunately. So yeah. Uh, yeah, we need those little things to help us along the way. Mm -hmm. And we have, um, yeah. we have licensing for a small company. So we have uh, like, it costs like 40 bucks per month for, for the PPU premium per user. Um, organizations so we have something for ah, them and yeah. then they can also use the the online features and then for the really big ones um it's basically depending on, on what they want um and also can, type of support and when like you this. run the api you can probably tell if it's per user or capacity in the workspace is that is that like a can you see the label of the type of capacity assigned to the workspace not really um yeah, I was just no, curious, curiously is one really. of those, like you just mentioned with premium per user and capacity. I'm wondering if there's a way to detect yeah. that and like essentially, because if a, if a company is really big, they're going to pay for capacity and they have a bigger budget. If right. they're smaller, they usually buy just yeah. per user. And if you can actually detect yeah. that, you can basically have those two pricing structures to, but right. you can, you can validate it when scanning the workspaces. If that was even something that's exposed is, you know, if somebody's paying for the per user license and you, you notice that they're hitting an actual 
paid capacity workspace like well no no, no mm -hmm. that's that's another level but i don't know if that's an experience right. i don't know if that um that assigned thing is something that's exposed at all via the api or not yeah i, I don't think it is um uh, also how we differentiate is basically the smaller ones they don't get any special support because uh, they're not yeah. paying much and also they probably don't need the support um so that's also where we differentiate um mm -hmm. and yeah it's just um Basically, the the premium capacity is is where you where you have the probably the biggest benefit of of really running things like this, um, and optimizing optimizing your tenant. Yeah, that makes total sense. This has been, I think, very informative. I've certainly learned about a few other things. Like I've never done the restore, uh, though I've seen the button, and it's nice to know that that happens. Um, and <laughs> so, is that kept? Curiously, is there a cache that ever gets cleared from that, or like if I? In theory, if I stepped away for uh, for a year and came back to my desktop, would there still be a log in there? Like, is there a certain point where it's yes. to truncate and remove? It's kept forever on your local machine, but only okay. there. And, uh, I guess follow up question to that: How um, let's just let's assume that like, well, what's what's the size approximately of each there, or what's the maximum size that you've seen those like restore? files because it's i'm assuming it's some type of a json or a text file or something that just yes. has the script yeah. um so they're only a couple kilobytes each i'm figuring exactly yeah i mean they okay. don't get really big because who is gonna delete well i mean some people might delete thousands of meshes actually we have seen this thing run on gigantic models um which is always really interesting for us also because you know we you develop this to the best of your knowledge and your experience mm -hmm. and what you see every day but then there are people all over the world uh, using it and then obviously everybody has a different use case and sometimes we get on calls to help people or stuff and and then we can see what they're doing and yeah sometimes like we have a model with eight thousand measures in columns you think like that these uh, don't exist oh god it does and you, you it's it probably does. one of those models that's like six or seven years old it has had like yes. multiple developers and they like they just keep adding more and more and more yeah. and more. And I feel really bad for those organizations because they are paying for Power BI. I don't know how much. It must be Ooh. crazy. I will say actually as a suggestion for one other thing for this is, so there, there's two parts. You want, to, you want to recognize unused measures. You also actually want to trim out um, duplicate measures. So, right. a, uh, so a measure yeah. that... And there's two types of duplicate measures. One of them is, you know, both of them is equals sum of sales amount. So if, if there's two measures with the identical formula, but also if there's another measure that is, let's just call it, let's call this sales two, and it just equals the sales one measure. It just, it's just a reference to the first one with no, no calculate, no variables. It's literally just pointing to that. And I've actually seen a lot of clients do that because they don't realize you can rename a measure in a visual. So they actually create a second measure with a new name uh -huh. and they point it to the first one because they didn't, understand that you could actually rename per visual so i think that those two patterns of a is there any measure that mm -hmm. is literally just the exact same formula or is there a, yeah. another measure that points to an existing one with zero transformations or there's you know, zero filter uh modifications because that that would also be mm -hmm. a way to go through and figure out what reports are using those transition them to the one of the two of them and then delete that other redundant calculation because i'm sure that that's a I've, I've seen that as a very common pattern for people. So that could be a, a next evolution of this, hopefully, is um, looking for those thing, measures that are used, but but the redundancy can be eliminated. That's a good one. I just wrote this down because I don't want to forget. Perfect, but, yeah. Uh, we have had those discussions with mm -hmm. uh, clients or people who... Uh, we've done a lot of presentations. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we, we've had that um, discussion before, especially with the DAX expression. Um, With 8,000 measures, not, guaranteed multiple of those measures are repeats. There's only so many columns you could have in a model yeah. to calculate. So I'm sure right. three or four different people all wrote an average of something or a sum of something and not realized that it already existed because there was too many to search through. I can either search through 8,000 yeah. measures or I just write another one. True, true. And then you have yeah. what you want, right? And just drag and drop it and that's it. That's a good point, yeah. And we we had this discussion on a tenant level somebody wanted to say hey i want to 
know which KPIs are duplicate across my tenant. You know, the KPI is identical with the DAX expression most of the mm -hmm. time. Um, so that was the discussion. But even in, in, a, in one report or one model, you're completely right that even there could be a big problem. Yeah. I guess last question for, because I'm always thinking of what ways can this break or, or incorrectly identify. So if, if somebody is connected to the core data set as a report, and they did a com um, and they created a report level measure, you know, because sometimes you do that. Maybe maybe the golden data set has actuals minus budget. You would prefer to see budget minus actuals. You want it flipped for some reason. Mm -hmm. So if you create a local measure, um, and either a use it in a visual in that report, or you don't use it in a visual, but it's still in the report, you know, as, as an added local field object, would this identify that as being used in either of those scenarios. So if the report level measure is just in the thin file um, and it's yep. not used anywhere, it's you can see it in any analysis, but it says it's not used. Okay. So if you use uh, but it will in it, that report. Uh -huh. uh, well, just one follow up to this. Will it identify it as the fact that there there is a, um, this golden data set measure is, will it, Will it show that it's referenced in a report scope measure, but unused? Or will there, essentially, will there be any metadata just to tell you that somebody has written a measure against it? Because if you delete it, because it is unused today, anytime that person opens out of the report, you'll still get a little error message next to that measure in your fields list, just because it's it's now referencing a measure you've deleted. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so you mean, uh, okay. So if, if, uh, if your original measure from the data set uh, is is used by a report level measure, then it's it's tagged as used. Okay, and even if that report level measure wasn't actually added to a visual, but they added it to the to the file, the, yes. the thin the thin. Okay, so the, yes. it's used in the fact yes. that it is being referenced. It hasn't been added to a visual yes. yet, but the use case is that yes, something is referencing it now. Okay, so like that, that that and that, that's what exactly. I would kind of want to see is the you know um, anybody who has referenced it in another downstream measure in a report, whether or not it's in a visual or not. But I can almost see that as like two items in your list. One, it's been referenced in this report. And two, on that report, it's on these three visuals or something like that. You can actually like, like list yeah, words. Yeah. We don't really want to differentiate because it's it's used somewhere. And yeah, we don't know. Maybe you need it for some reason. And that's why um, when I showed this, uh, it's only used once. Maybe I can just uh, run uh, the local mode again doesn't matter um if even if if an artifact that we get as used is only used once um you know, like that's why i always check for the biggest one here and then yeah maybe it's only used once it could only be used in the online analysis obviously mm -hmm. okay. in one of the report level measures and then you can say hey let's kick it out <laughs> um because the report level measure but oh, yeah, you would also have to check, obviously, if the report level measure is used. So that's that's something, this cross-check you have to do manually in that sense. Or you go through the analytics, through those calculations here, um, to figure out exactly what's happening. Like this measure okay. is used and this measure is, and then is this used? Here you would see it, right? Um, and I think the, yeah. and I guess the last final question on that is, because I, I know this, these are similar questions that I had with MK, because they're, there's a lot of very obscure ways you can use a calculation, like titles, you know, dynamic titles. Mm -hmm. The measure can be literally in one visual in the title. It could be the conditional formatting color for a font. You created a measure that is used in one right. spot for conditional formatting using the F of X button. And I'm guessing this still scans the, does this, uh, this would still detect those, um, I think as Kurt calls them, report scoped measures, the, those custom ones that are basically de designed for a very specific visualization. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we haven't found anything uh, besides those limitations on the website that that is not okay. working, and we can Perfect. go through them quickly. Um, uh, yeah. So there are certain very very specific things you can do in Power Query that are just a problem for us, and we don't mm -hmm. really we don't really cover that. Uh, but most things in Power Query are covered. Um, then and role level security yeah. would still would still. Uh... Oh, yeah. detect that so like so there's user principle role is is what you would you know, do for for user-based security but if you had a measure with that function and then you just reference the measure inside of the the role itself but nowhere else in the model it'd still catch that yeah so 
things like that are referenced in the model, like also column sorting, right? Nice. Relationships, things like this. That's that's all covered. Um, one problem, for example, we have, and that's uh, also important to understand, is imagine a table where none of the columns are used, but then you do a count uh -huh. rows on the table. Since you're not referencing any columns, MeasureCooler will will exactly like you said at the beginning, it will delete all the columns. And then also you cannot do account rows anymore because we don't really look at table references. Mm. It's like a different thing. So that's that's one of the limitations. But how often is that going to happen? Well, I, like, so yeah. as a suggestion to maybe patch that is, so the only thing necessary in that table are any columns that are that are in a key. Because part of it is like the count rows is likely it's a fact table that you're typically doing that against and you need the date yeah. key, you need the product key, but any right. other column that is uh, not keyed, it would be safe to remove essentially. So I'm wondering if there's a way to detect like, is there a table name that is any function that references this, but nothing else that's flag one. And then flag two is what's not part of a relationship. And then those are the columns mm. that you could remove in, in, uh, in the Power Query editor uh, safely. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, though, the, the key columns are also most costly, right? So if you really only want to do a count rows, it's better to have like a zero or one column. Um, but yeah, um, look, we can definitely, there, there would be a way to do this probably, and maybe we will in the next version, but so far uh, it's still out of scope. So. That's fair. Okay. No, and, and I also, think, um, yep, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying like half the half the fun of this for me for a lot of these streams too is like I I love getting technical with some of this stuff because there there's there's so many exceptions you know to to, to modeling yeah. like this and I'm I'm glad that most of the the gotchas that I can even think of have been addressed or found out I'm just I'm sure because of all of the telemetry that you've had from having clients with eight thousand measure models that that run against this and you you probably right. got a lot of uh, useful information on the results of that scan. Yeah, and a lot of error messages that we had to fix. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Perfect. Yeah, and just generally, um, right now, so in this version, and, and this will go away in the next version, um, but right now you still might have to do several runs to remove all the unused artifacts because something that is currently unused, and we could delete that, um, it could... Like here, for example, this could use one of like this could use product name, right? Order date is using product name, and it's only using product name. Then order date, um, uh, then product name would be used. But uh, once I delete the product name, then suddenly order date is, is is unused. You know, like we have this cascading basically. Um, that uh, it it's possible that you need multiple runs uh, for to find all the unused artifacts because at first. A certain portion is unused and then when you remove that it could be that some things mm -hmm. were only um using that basically no oh, okay yeah that makes sense okay now uh, this this has been fantastic i'm gonna flip back over to our main screen oh the talking screen there we go no i really appreciate Should you I stop back sharing? On this um you can keep it i, I have i have us on the other screen now um sure. but yeah i just wanted to uh, share my appreciation for this i certainly learned a lot of new stuff um, on the tool and discovered some new things that I didn't actually realize were there as some of those preview features. So it's it's good to see this evolve. And I like the I like the fact that you're starting to add some analysis features as well for some of those weights and others for the um, for the measures within the size of the model, things that are unique that you could delete uh, potentially if you only have one measure point into those. And looking forward to seeing some of those uh, tenant analysis features come out soon as well. Yeah. It was it was nice having a really cool discussion with you mm -hmm. and actually one thing i forgot to mention is that so besides this tenant analysis um in the longer run we're trying to make measure pillar into some kind of api call that you can automatically integrate it into your deployment and basically call it at the right time and then basically go from there without having to do much manually anymore okay no that will be really cool when that comes out yeah, but I, I think this has been a very fruitful conversation. I've certainly learned a lot, and hopefully the the people uh, tuning in today or watching this down uh, the pipeline in the future 
um, we'll go check out the tool. The links are in the description uh, to be able to download this. And again, it has four local files. Uh, essentially, can be ran for free. You can uh, have a paid version for any of the enterprise features that are available for this. But this is definitely a cornerstone tool now, for sure, in my toolbox for uh, any times that I need to do auditing of stuff. So I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you and your team have spent time to get this up and running. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, have a great rest of your Thursday night. Um, everyone else, um, enjoy your day, evening, or night. And I will see you next week where uh, Will Thompson is going to be on actually to do a deep dive on the new data activator um, each, uh, product that Microsoft released this month. So I'm excited for that as well. But uh, have a great rest of your day, Gregor, uh, or evening, and I will uh, talk Thank to you. you soon. Yeah. Cheers. To you, everyone. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider hitting that like and subscribe button. And if you want to help support this channel, take a look at our channel memberships or our merchandise store for cool swag. And last but not least, please consider sharing this video on your social media platform of choice to help our channel grow. So, until next time.